You're listening to The Valley Current. So welcome in to a special edition of the series that we've been running here from Silicon Valley. And we've got a great speaker today, CPA Steve Raymond. And Steve, I'm so appreciative of you being here on on Friday. We tried to get this to be done on Friday the 13th, but we're doing it instead on Friday the 20th because there's even more information. And this is part of the series that we call The Valley Currents, and we publish it on our website and on a podcast channel. But Steve, just tell the folks a few minutes about yourself because you are one of the go-to people in our office for accounting problems, and we're in a very special environment where obviously there's a shutdown based on the coronavirus that has been spreading rapidly, although I guess the most recent news is things have topped off in China and look like maybe we're on the improvement swing in China, but a worsening cycle in Italy and Iran, and maybe a worsening cycle in the US. So that's all news that people probably have, but we're gonna bring them a tax and accounting and legal strategy for getting through this over the next, what might be three, six or nine months. But tell folks a few minutes about yourself and then we'll go over the agenda for the call. Thank you for having me, Jack. I've been doing accounting here um, for startup companies uh, and entrepreneurial clients for the last 15 years. I have a small firm um, headquartered uh, in downtown San Francisco um, on uh, California Street near the Embarcadero Bark Station. Because of these extraordinary uh, circumstances, we're working from home. Right, you're working from home and almost seamlessly though we had a bit of a problem with the connections but it's an example of the first principle of working remotely is you better have lots of patience because it's not really the same as being there in person so just accept that there's going to be hiccups there's going to be microphone issues there's going to be video issues there's going to be all sorts of stuff and people just have to be patient and what i like to say is relax Look at all the time you've saved in the commute and be positive about it all. And you might find you can reallocate equipment. We've dedicated, by the way, we pulled out all of our old equipment and gave all the paralegals additional laptops to use and dedicate to Zoom with microphones separate from the PC that they're operating their email and their Slack and other resources that we'll talk about. So the idea was give people a chance to know their video is going to work and it won't corrupt whatever they're doing on the file because you know how upsetting it is if a machine blows up in the middle of you writing an email or writing a brief or writing an accounting spreadsheet, right? So you have to have a lot of patience. I consider myself very fortunate to have had a half dozen spare computers um, when all configured and ready to go right. for this tax season. Right, it's a good it's a good use, and in fact, there are resources available, and I'm sure they're going to keep getting cheaper and cheaper. Where for a couple hundred dollars, you can get a 16 gigabyte memory. That's 16 gigabytes of RAM memory, and sometimes 512 gigabytes of uh, SD electronic memory for long term memory on an HP laptop or HP desktop machine. For sometimes a couple hundred dollars re- refurbished, you buy that machine and you dedicate it to your video. And the first principle might be try to be resilient about using the equipment you have. You don't have to buy more equipment, but there's a lot of equipment. In fact, we dug out all of our old laptops. Some of them were Windows 7 machines. And we said, you know, that works with Zoom. Let's just use it. It's not like video is an intensive process. It's intensive for the bandwidth, but the machine can be almost any machine. In fact, some people run it off their TVs, and that's a way to get video to, if you like video, and people seem to like it, and Zoom as a stock, of course, has done pretty well in the last few sessions. So let's talk for a few minutes about what you're seeing, because I'll just start the conversation around. I'm seeing a lot of clients ask questions about, can I lay people off legally 
during this period or am I going to suffer from some wrongful termination cases? And of course, they're not saying they're definitely going to lay people off, but they are saying, look, if there's no inbound revenue and no inbound work and people are at home, and of course, everyone likes to think, well, if people are home, they're not really working or they're not working as hard or they're not working as effectively or as efficiently. This whole scenario may prove that we can work effectively and efficiently. So I say to people, first thing is take a deep breath and don't immediately assume that you have to lay people off because it might be the case that this is over in the next month or so. Obviously, that's an optimistic scenario, but I talk all the time to clients who are very optimistic as well as some that are very pessimistic. The truth is somewhere in between. But what's your sense of it from your side of things in San Francisco? Well, um, I have international clients in China, in Taiwan, and in Italy. And I was just on the phone with an Italian client um, yesterday. And um, the situation there is pretty grim because they're out of medical supplies. And they have to triage who gets the ventilators and who get sent home with uh, self-administered drugs. Right. Um, I understand they had about 600 uh, deaths in the last 24 hours. Right. Um, hopefully our trajectory here in USA will be closer to the Chinese trajectory. And certainly for planning, we want to know how long this will last. And that affects valuations. That affects um, decisions to hire or fire or right. close the business completely and cut our losses. Um, if we follow the Chinese model, they were about where we were three months ago, and now and seem to be contained, where they have more incidents um, from people returning from abroad than new incidents uh, locally. If we can be as efficient or better in our controls, then perhaps uh, I would guess that we have another three months of in place and severe restriction. Right. I mean, my working assumption with my team of people, and we're not a big firm, we're under 20 people total, and we're pretty good at using technology, is that we have at least a three-month hike, and probably most people will get it. Most people will survive it. Most people will say, gosh, you know, this was much bigger fear than it was reality. We're all basically relatively young. We're not in our 80s or 90s. I have a next door neighbor that turned 90 today, 9-0. He's still alive and kicking. He thinks that the fear factor is way overblown. The Spanish flu, which obviously everyone analogizes to over 100 years ago, didn't really kill a huge, it killed a huge number of people, but not a huge percentage of the population. And it was pretty awful. So there's sort of a, a overreaction to some degree. And obviously there are people like Warren Buffett that are sitting on billions with a B of cash who love these once in a lifetime opportunities to swoop in and buy companies for probably 50 cents on the dollar while the blood is on the streets, right? Yes. I mean, it's an interesting situation because you could say he's been stockpiling cash for a while thinking the market has been too high and maybe the market has been. The stock market is dizzying if you follow it daily. If you look at the big picture trends, we've obviously done some great things in life. The story I tell the people is when I was a kid, we lived, five of us, in 800 square feet with one bathroom, five of us. Today, a couple in general will be upset if they don't have at least two bathrooms to each other, as in four bathrooms. I mean, it's a pretty amazing statement about how improved quality of life is and the evolution of our sort of overall improvement. But in general, we wanna cover a few topics that are much more than just the facts of this story, but what people can do from an accounting point of view. I could tell you some of the things that we've done is look at how to use whatever spare time exists to improve the future practice of law. Kind of like, what are all the things you never got to, but now that the clients are not necessarily hammering 
for anything to be done instantly. What can you get to? What are you seeing from the accounting side? Um, you know, there's a, a whole range of insights um, from this situation. Um, I certainly see a bunch of AP departments out there right now trying to figure out who's going to be paid first and who's going to be paid last. Right and where we can get some interim financing. And um, uh, certainly um, uh, stiffing your accountants or your lawyers or your employees is not something I'd recommend. No, I mean, look, lawyers are, and accountants are usually unfortunately at the bottom of the list. Maybe landlords are at the top of the list, but people can number one, ask their landlords if we're making a list of top 10, you can ask your landlord for small businesses for some relief. Landlords obviously typically are paying banks because they finance their properties with banks. So there's only so much you can ask from a landlord. But you can start going through what you refer to as AP, it means accounts payable. You can go through your payables and start to create, you know, priority one, priority two, priority three. Priority one in California from a legal point of view, and you probably would agree with me, is you have to make your payroll. If you don't make your payroll, you have personal liability, you have potential additional penalty liability for the lack of withholdings. That's the hard cheese in this because people want to make their payroll, but they also know payroll can be pretty big. And at some level, the question is, what do you do about it? You have to make payroll because you have personal liability for not making payroll. The board of directors does and the officers do in California, which gets to the hard cheese question of, do you do a layoff? Because if you're not gonna make payroll effectively, you are terminating, if not directly, you're constructively terminating people. There are certainly employers that run out of money in California and fail to make payroll. When they do that, they face labor code penalties labor code uh, statutory remedies and labor code attorney's fees in California. So Steve, you would probably say on a priority list, definitely make your payroll, right? Absolutely. I, I'm completely in agreement and I'd put your accountant and your lawyer just below payroll because you, nev you never know when you're going to need us. Um, right. And your employees and your vendors, they will either take you through this or um, not take you through this. And I think that um, there's some businesses out there, frankly, that were operating at the edge to begin with. Right. That were spending all their energy and resources chasing after bad business. Right. And with no reserves and inadequate marketing and um, compliance. Right. And those businesses should take this as a wake up call. Time to close. Right. Time to do something different. Right. You could say the weak, the weaker businesses in crises like this will inevitably be forced out of business. And we may see even some public companies that are otherwise would have been quite strong, like even hotel companies, maybe some of the car rental companies being forced out of business. So you could say there's a certain degree of Darwinism in this where it's a little bit like, yeah, the survival of the fittest. That's kind of what's playing out at this point. So the first point is you've got to make payroll. You've got to do that. You've got a personal liability if you don't do that. If you're not going to do that, maybe it makes sense to do the layoff. But there's a smart way to do a layoff and there's a stupid way to do a layoff. And obviously for most people, employment is at will. And they understand that there could be layoffs or there could be terminations. And the good news in some ways is the businesses probably need to respect that maybe 20% of their people are dead wood. And there is dead wood in businesses. And to some degree, this sort of shock does get rid of the dead wood. Now, it may not be very fair to the dead wood, but there's a certain reality there. And so that second point is pick your poison. Who do you lay off in a situation like this? It's probably not your best salesperson that you want to lay off. That's pretty stupid. But you probably want to look at some fat 
that represents non-performing functionality that maybe can be automated, maybe can be outsourced, maybe can be delegated to others. I mean, t tell people what you think you would advise people who are saying, look, I got to make cuts. What do you think I should do, Steve? What, how do I handle this? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think consulting your attorney and your payroll people about how to do the layoff is critical. Right. Um, or how to convert people from uh, employment to contract. And um, so if you've been doing payroll yourself, then your business is probably one of the, and you're, as a small business, then you're probably a business that should be closed. <laughs> Because um, you made that's a an, business, that's you, an you interesting just statement. Are that, not taking payroll. You're not giving payroll the serious, the serious respect it requires. So um, I often recommend uh, Paychex or ADP, and they can help you with conversions and um, uh, layoffs. Um, right. And here in California, we also have, especially San Francisco, we have a lot of healthcare. Um, compliance requirements. Right. Um, there's something called the IIPP, Illness Injury and Prevention Program, uh, Workplace Safety Program. And again, your payroll people can help you with that. Right. Um, but uh, to your bigger question, Jack, as to who to or which functions to um, outsource, um, I, I think that uh, we need to keep our areas of key competence and anything else um, that can be done remotely um, potentially should be done remotely. Yeah, people don't understand that concept of key competence or core competence, which is your value add in the equation is a certain set of functions that you know how to do. So for example, in Computer Law Group, we understand computer industry litigation, we understand security fraud, we understand uh, intellectual property, we understand startup and growth companies. Our core competencies as listed on our website, there's at least a dozen of them. But we're not here as tax experts, we're not here as bankruptcy attorneys, we're not here as personal injury or other type family uh, trusts and estates. Those are all areas that are non-core and we will refer those to other people just as you refer certain things in the accounting practice, you have to then take Occam's razor, this idea of let's get down to what you actually do well and people hire you for and get rid of the areas that are not core competencies. You could argue that the, uh, the auto industry has been doing this for a while. You could argue that automakers have become more and more specialized over time like Tesla, is an electric auto manufacturer, they will never make a gas-based engine. They will never deal with carburation. They will never deal with mufflers. They will never deal with uh, gas lines or gas tanks because that's not their business. They don't know anything about those things. Maybe they do, but they are certainly not core competencies. They're all about batteries and electric motors. Well, every business has that kind of focus. So in some ways you could say, look at your people, and if the people are not supporting a core competency, think about whether the cut, this is an opportune time for a cut. So if you have somebody who's doing, like I'll say in a law firm, doing cleanup work, uh, cleaning up the office space, outsource that to a contract firm that comes in once a night after the business is closed to clean up the offices. In most cases, the office will have done that. And your point about payroll, in most cases, real business delegates payroll. They don't want to handle payroll. It's too complicated. There's too much computerization. People get it wrong. The withholdings become wrong. It generates tax penalties. That's your point about using someone like Paychex or Trinet or some of the other folks that really specialize in payroll, right? Payroll is something I don't do in my office either. I refer it out just as to describe. Now, this brings up the question of AB5 here in California right. and the broader overseas regulatory um, uh, environment for 
who is considered a contractor and who's considered an employee. Right. And um, the two key tests in my mind, it's the details are much larger, but yes. and require somebody like you or me to consult. But um, in terms of the big picture, um, the um, uh, two key criteria I see are the uh, degree of control yes. that the company exercises over the contractor. Um, an employee can be highly controlled, even micromanaged. A contractor cannot. Right. Um, and also the ability for the contractor to subcontract. And that's a much bigger thing in overseas regulations than here in California. Right. But I do recommend that when you decide what you're going to outsource, only outsource things that you'd be willing to have subcontracted by your contractor to some subcontractor. Right. Let's drill down on that because there is legislation called Assembly Bill 5. It became effective on January 1, 2020. It changed to some degree the law in the direction of the default is if someone's providing services for you, they are by default employees. Now, obviously, that may seem odd to you because most people in this world are not necessarily employees, but if you have them in your offices and or you have them directly connected to your email system or you've given them a phone number, a business card, you've made them look like they're employees, trust me, California will have them look like employees. So in general, what I would say to you is uh, keep in mind that people are typically in California going to be viewed as employees under AV5, Assembly Bill 5. But we're now in a special situation where California is probably going to recognize that in a layoff scenario where you would otherwise lay people off, it's better. Tune in next on The Valley Current.